met somebody who's so naturally curious, who will always ask another question. I want to understand this. I want to know this. She um, would go to seminars with me and stay and like talk to the seminar speaker after and what we'll about this, what about that? And they would always say, to keep that student. Like, she's, she's, she's special. But then she doesn't get carried away, right? So she thinks about all these things, but then she does the most meticulous science you can imagine. She has this extraordinary inner peace that she brings to the bench, and she's just patient. She gets in the zone, and she says, okay, this is what needs to be done. She always check with me, like, if she has any thoughts, she doesn't, you know, want to make an assumption that's going to take her down the wrong way. And we'll talk it through, and then she just, she does it, and she does it beautifully. Said, you know, I don't know if you understand how hard it is to learn the cochlea. She's like, it's really hard. And she said, maybe we could have some systems to make it easier for people to learn. And she put these systems in place, and it's made it a really much better place for all the students and technicians to, to come in. During the pandemic, she said, I'm going to make good use of my time. So not only did she actually take an un, uh, unanalyzed single cell data set and teach herself everything and analyze it and come up with data, but then she also recorded a series of videos for the undergraduates in the lab explaining DNA and proteins. And we still have all of those videos. And I often will um, tell students in MB215 who are like, I haven't thought about DNA since middle school. What are you doing to me? And uh, you know, I'm like, here's here's some videos to watch. And they're, they're actually really this reminds me also. She she was learning how to dissect cochleas, and she was at the the biology the inner ear course, and she noticed something that nobody else had noticed, and um, identified a pre line that we can actually use that has changed what my lab does. And that was just she looked at it and she said, I think this could be useful. Um, and then here's a couple more of. Um, her images and you'll see even more uh, in the talk. So I'll end by saying that it's been an absolute pleasure to work with you. I'm so proud of everything you've done and what you've brought to the lab and um, you, you will have, you absolutely have a legacy and a home in our lab for, for forever. So thank you. Yay! Um, is I things good on Zoom? Awesome. Hi everyone. It's so good to see you. I'm so excited uh, to see you all here. Um, thank you so much, Lisa, for that wonderful, wonderful uh, introduction. Um, I'm really excited to share with you guys uh, my thesis work. Um, so I'll just jump right in. So our auditory system encodes incredibly complex sound information. For example, we're able to hear across a huge range of sound intensities, from the drip of water in this leaky faucet to the crack of thunder from a nasty rainstorm. Additionally, our auditory system can help us localize unseen cues or predators for example, these young men might use auditory cues to be alerted to oncoming traffic. Um, and most importantly, in my opinion, our auditory system allows us to enjoy music. And auditory encoding begins as sound stimuli travel through our middle ear and are first detected in this spiral-shaped cochlea. Here is a wedge of this cochlea depicting rows of mechanically sensitive hair cells. Uh, depicting rows of mechanically sensitive hair cells uh, that detect sound information and transduce the sound information to spiral ganglion neurons, or SG noxious sound stimuli. Meanwhile, there's a single row of inner hair cells uh, which transforms sound waves into graded electrical potentials that are then transmitted to type 1 SGNs via these highly specialized synapses. Um, and type 1 SGNs encode all of the information that we think of as hearing. These cells are charged with the formidable task of relaying all the information about the frequency, intensity, and timing of the sounds we hear. Um, and they do so with incredibly high speed and fidelity in incredibly complex sound environments. Synaptic and molecular heterogeneity of type 1 SGNs, which I'm going to focus on for the rest of my talk and simply refer to as SGNs. 
So early electrophysiological studies found that SGNs can be binned into three electrophysiological So in the upper left-hand corner, you can see the staining for the ribbons that we use that we stain for with CTBP2. And each individual dot or punctum corresponds to an individual ribbon. Meanwhile, in the lower left-hand corner, you can see the staining for glue R2, and each individual punctum corresponds to the cluster of glutamate receptors in the postsynaptic membrane of one SGN. Yeah. Staining in cochlear whole mounts has revealed that calretinin staining intensity differs in the projections of SGNs in this pillar to medialar axis, uh, with pillar projections having higher calretinin and medialar projections having lower calretinin. Synaptogenesis or synapse formation. Um, and this is also uh, during the window in which SGNs are molecularly differentiating. Meanwhile, these factors can also heterodimerize and that completely changes their DNA uh, recognition sequences. So for example, uh, MathB, uh, this is an example of a heterodimer that MathB creates with CFOS. And you can see that this completely changes the DNA binding, um, and it actually results in um, the conjoined DNA binding domains of each factor in the dimer uh, together. However, when we analyze the volume of the glutamate receptor puncta, and even when we looked at these stains, we saw that there were some puncta that were really big and some that were really small. And when, so when we analyzed the volume, while we saw that there was no change in the average volume of the glutamate receptor puncta, uh, we saw that there was larger variability in the GUR2 punctum size, as quantified here. But you can see that the double knockouts had larger GUR2 volume interquartile ranges. It can have both antagonistic and synergistic effects um, on SGN synapses and auditory function. Um, and these opposing phenotypes made us wonder whether one of the ways that CMAF and MAFB can affect SGNs is by imparting subtype-specific synaptic properties on SGNs. And I want to bring you back to what I told you um, in the beginning of this talk about the molecular <coughs> heterogeneity uh, across these SGNs. And also by reminding you that CMAF and MAFB are changing features of the synapses, such as the size and relative location, that are thought to change across SGN subtypes. And at this stage, Netrin G1 Cre is restricted to BC SGNs. It doesn't capture all of the Bs and Cs, but all of the red fluorescent cells are uh, Bs, B and Cs. Meanwhile, when we looked at 1B one one and 1C one marker genes, we saw that this, the 1A cluster in the control and the mutant did not express these 1A, 1B and 1C marker genes. For example, RUNCS1, you can see is expressed in the 1Bs and Cs for the controls and the knockouts. So this suggests that the CMAF knockout 1A cluster is still likely retaining many features of a 1A identity. So to look at gene expression changes between control and mutant SGNs, I compared control and mutant SGN transcriptomes and asked what were the differentially expressed genes when I compared all control SGNs to all mutant SGNs. And I saw that there were several differentially expressed genes as shown on this volcano plot, uh, which is a plot of the average log two-fold change um, versus the negative log 10 of the p-value. While the control neurons were still forming their three distinct clusters, the double knockouts were forming their own independent amorphous cluster. And I want to point out that um, when we looked at subtype markers, uh, such as 1A markers, such as uh, calretinin, we saw that this double knockout cluster didn't express any 1A markers. Meanwhile, when we looked at B and C markers, we saw that this double knockout <coughs> cluster seem to almost exclusively express 1B and 1C markers. But I want to point out that the double knockouts are not suddenly clustering with the Bs and Cs. So it's not the case that they're becoming Bs and Cs. And there's really cool uh, work coming out now 
uh, looking at the transcription profiles of SGNs across development and showing that they travel through this common BC precursor state and then downregulate BC genes to split off into the 1As. Therefore, it's possible that the double knockouts are somehow arrested in development. Meanwhile, we seem to see the opposite effect in MAFB knockouts. Uh, which uh, has had attenuated P1 amplitudes in smaller synaptic puncta and seemed to drive expression uh, in the B and C SGNs. And I think this is a really beautiful way of how biology can use just two molecules to exact extremely diverse features across a population of cells. And I think that uh, this work is really uh, opening the door to really take a look at the molecular properties of these uh, synapses, which have been long studied and appreciated for many years in the field. Um, and I can't wait to see what future students uh, do. So I want to say thank you. Um, I'm going to give some professional acknowledgments and then give some time for questions and then give some more extended acknowledgments afterwards. Um, I want to thank the Pink community overall. It's been really a pleasure being uh, your friend and colleague. Uh, I want to thank USN uh, for being such a wonderful community. Uh, the, faculty, the facilities and support staff, the neurobiology imaging facility uh, who helped access us, uh, give us access to Amaris, uh, the virus sequencing core, as well as my uh, fellowship that funded me for a couple of years. So you're asking if I have any speculation about how GATA3 is setting up this complementary expression as sure. math and math B? Um, you kind of touched upon there might be a ground state where neurons may express all and then over time they might start to express in a different way? Yeah, yeah. So there's work coming out now. Um, I think actually GATA3 is maybe a little bit upstream of subtype diversification, maybe. Um, but there's like these other transcription factors that we're starting to look at and be really interested, including RUNCS1, which I talked about, which is your voracious passion for life and doing exactly what you love. It's always been my desire and dream to be able to give back to you in the way that you've uh, sacrifice for me, and I'm so relieved that those days are finally in sight. I love you both very much. Um, but more importantly, you make even the most mundane days both hilarious and interesting. You're an amazing scientist and my best friend. <laughs>